Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Andy Ferris. Um, I am taking the final third of this course with you guys. So unit six and unit seven. Um, and we'll be talking about discrete event simulations and randomness and Monte Carlo methods. And then we'll move on to sort of more different types of um, data problems, machine learning problems and this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I'll just before we really go on very far, I'm just, I'll just talk a little bit about myself. Not because I particularly like talking about myself, but I, I just remember being in university and all you'd meet is academics. Um, and you, you know that there was sort of, you could do an a, um, undergraduate or PhD in maths or physics or something like that. And that's basically the type of people that you talk to. So um, just thought it might be interesting to hear about another trajectory. Um, so, I did my undergraduate at the Australian National Uni in Canberra. Um, I did an honours in physics and then moved up to UQ. And here I did a PhD in physics. So my speciality was um, simulations of, of quantum systems. So I would um, run computer simulations for experiments uh, with a group of Matthew Davis in the physics department. Um, I, I believe he's now the uh, head of physics somehow. Um, and uh, more, uh, later on, I, I did some more postdocs. Um, so I, I did continue the academic uh, strand for some time. Um, I, I went and did a postdoc over in Canada, uh, working in quantum information theory and, and again, the simulation techniques, Monte Carlo techniques, um, tensor network techniques for simulations. Um, and then I moved over to Spain. I had a um, Marie Curie grant over there, uh, got to live by the, the beach and, and work with good people for a few years. So that was, that, that, that was excellent. Uh, and then once that was winding up, I was sort of wondering what next. Um, so I found myself in a situation where, you know, I could potentially try and find more academic postings, or I could actually think about branching out and doing something different. Um, I was fortunate in that uh, I had a friend who I did uh, my PhD with um, who was working at a, well, it was sort of almost touted as a startup at the time, um, a, a group that Paul might have talked about briefly, Paul B, um, called Fugro, um, Roams. Uh, we, we used uh, with the fly planes and, and make 3D maps of the world. And, and the, the job is to, to model the world and find defects and help people manage their physical assets. For example, uh, we, we'd have a look for um, power poles that have fallen over or trees that are touching power lines are gonna start a fire and this kind of thing. So um, it's sort of remote sensing and um, feature detection kind of work, um, which is, yeah, which was, which was really, really interesting, really, really fun. And that's where I met Paul Ballette. Um, so first Paul. Um, he was working there at the time. He'd been there some years before I'd started. Um, and I got to work with him and my other friend, Chris, um, for a number of years, um, which was great. And then more recently, I, I left there and joined again, Paul Ballette. Um, we're working for the same startup called Alara. Uh, we're doing economic simulations and things, uh, which is actually, actually a lot of work, which is, quite related to unit six and seven, quite interestingly, which is, which is going to be fun. Um, right, so that's just my spiel. Uh, what, one thing I, I, I did find throughout my many different endeavors is that I've always supplied computers to solve my problems, right? And maths, computers and maths to solve problems. So if, whether it's in physics, uh, I used to like playing and creating computer games. Um, uh, you know, but yeah, quantum simulations, um, you know, finding power poles out of a point cloud or, 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 or modeling a business and see whether they're about to go bankrupt or make lots of money and what they can do to be better. Any of those things, it, it, all, it all came down to doing lots and lots of number crunching on computers, okay? So uh, from, from a pretty young age, I was interested in programming, um, learned a few different programming languages and for, for this kind of work, I, I did kind of settle on, on Julia as being a, a good choice for, um, for, okay, how do I get my mouse up there? Oh, there. Right. Sorry, everyone. 
Julia was a, a good choice for doing um, this kind of, of um, these, these kind of mathematical programming problems, okay? So there, there's, a, being, there, there's a few different things you want when you're doing mathematics on a computer. If the problem is easy, you do it with pen and paper, or you could, you could do it with a, a simple computer program. But the problems which are actually interesting, you, you, know, you know, cutting edge or, or whatever, they're going to take a lot of time to, to solve, you know? Um, you know, you're, you're, the CPU in this computer can do uh, several trillion calculations per second, right? I mean, I can't add, multiply two floating point numbers in, in a minute <laughs> if you're talking about 64 bits of precision. And so uh, it can do a lot, but yet you're going to need to push it really hard to get, to get um, interesting results. So you need a programming language, which is, is sort of um, kind of like powerful, uh, fast, sort of like, like, but if you, if you go back and use a, a, a simple low level language like C, then it gets a bit hard with the mathematical abstractions. So Julia is this language which lets you have these nice mathematical abstractions, and yet it basically compiles the code down like a C compiler into to machine code before it runs. So, um, you know, speaking, this, this course has sort of been something we've had on the cards for a couple of years now. So it's been great kind of working with Yoni over this time. So thank you, Yoni, for having me here. Um, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, I think that's it all I'm going to do for an introductory spiel. Does anyone ha want to say anything before I get into the content of Unit 6? Do I have any questions? Okay, we'll just move on. Okay, so Unit 6, um, we, um, da, 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 we're going to want this one. This text, I don't know if that's going to be too big or not. We'll just we'll just leave it at this Zoom level so that everyone can read it. Hopefully it's fine. Um, so in this unit, unit six, we're going to look at Monte Carlo simulations and and, and discrete event simulation. Um, so we're not really we're not looking at you know something really um, concrete. Uh, well, concrete, but like solid um, and exact science of like uh, polynomials and, and and integers. We're really going to be moving into the fuzzy world of randomness with with you know you know simulations with floating point numbers and things like this. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, as with maths, always there's connections between all different fields. Um, uh, a lot of the results that you would use to, to create a good random number generator actually come from number theory, but uh, we won't really spend more than a few minutes on that topic. Um, Monte Carlo is a word which, I don't know, has anyone in this room or online, have, they, have you heard of Monte Carlo simulation before? Or is this a new terminology for everyone? Put your hand up if you've heard of it. We've got, oh, okay, most of you. Okay, great, great. So hopefully that, that won't be too bad. So um, Monte Carlo simulation is just, just a type of simulation that uses randomness. So back at the end of World War II, um, the, there were some uh, scientists, physicists, and mathematicians working on the Manhattan Project. Uh, you guys are pretty young, so just to point out that that's when they made the nuclear bomb. Um, so Back in the day, they had to use uh, rooms full of mostly women uh, writing numbers on pieces of paper, passing them around the room to try and calculate, you know, to perform a simulation of, you know, the neutrons in a nuclear bomb or something to figure out how to make it explode. Um, and people came up with the great idea of, of using electronics instead of people to do that work. And they built the ENIAC, which was the first programmable electronic computer. And this gave the people some freedom for, for um, thinking of different ways that you might solve some problems. Um, so it's been known for a long, long time that you could, you know, you know randomness and, and stochasticness and, and all these things had been studied in maths for 100 years prior. Um, and, you, you know, statistics have been studied for many hundreds of years or possibly even thousands. Um, but, uh, and, and it's sort of been known that you could kind of use maths to kind of simulate um, a problem with randomness, right? So let's say we have the atoms in this room, the gas, you know, the, there's these gas atom particles bouncing, molecules bouncing into each other. Um, and you could do statistics on, um, you know, given the temperature and the pressure of the gas, you could think statistically what, where might the particles begin. And then you could just use deterministic physics like Newton's equations to figure out where they're gonna go next. And you can do an ensemble 
of different simulations with different initial conditions and to come up with an ensemble of different answers. Okay, and you might see that on average, you know, the particles move from the high pressure region to the low pressure region and things like this. Um, so that, that kind of uh, um, uh, random sampling type of simulation has been known for a long time. But what, what these people, these um, Ulam, von Neumann and, and Metropolis meant when they, when they came up with this idea of Monte Carlo is that they could solve deterministic problems by using randomness. Okay, so which was, which was actually really interesting. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have a lot of time in this course to get into to that, that side of things. Uh, we'll, Monte Carlo these days generally gets applied to any simulation with randomness, um, but we'll be probably using it mostly in this discrete event simulator, which is just a, a it's a more straightforward stochastic simulator. Um, Monte Carlo, interestingly, is the name of a city famous for gambling, and they used it as a, a code name in the Manhattan Project because Ulam's uncle spent a lot of time gambling in Monte Carlo. So I, I always think that's a cute side story. <sighs> okay, so discrete event simulators. Um, as I mentioned, you could, you could think of it as a, a, a type of Monte Carlo, if you like, um, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Monte Carlo is a, a broad field, though. Like when I when I was doing my PhD, we were using Monte Carlo simulations for quantum systems, so dynamic simulations. People use Monte Carlo, um, quantum Monte Carlo, to simulate, um, you know, to find the ground state or excited states of, of molecules, and to do particle physics and all sorts of different uh, high energy theory, low energy theory, and physics. Um, and yeah. Get, and it gets applied to all sorts of problems. Um, so that there is numerous different groups at UQ that, you know, uh, world-class practitioners in Monte Carlo and even a couple of people who are world-class, you know, creators of Monte Carlo methods and, and techniques and writing textbooks and things. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we'll, we're in this, this unit, our goal was going to be create a discrete simulation engine, discrete event simulation engine. Um, and I'll just talk to you about the things that we're, we're going to achieve. Um, this lecture will focus more on just random numbers and randomness. And next, the following lectures, we'll move on and we'll, we'll get in and I'll explain better what a discrete event simulation is and what a discrete event simulation engine might be. Okay. Um, while we're on the topic of future lectures, uh, just to, to mix things up a bit, I believe Paul V is back tomorrow. Um, sorry about that. It's sort of, we've got, um, because our guest lecturer is actually unwell, unfortunately, and uh, it, it sounds like um, she'll, she'll be scheduled for later in the course. Okay, so but I believe um, I was told, oh no. Yoni has overridden me. I have old news. Oh, you can only see my desktop. Hearing me. Okay. Oh, this is this is annoying. Sorry, could someone say that again? Yes. Um, tomorrow is a consult hour via Zoom. So yes, sorry, I was right. It is a consult hour, hour with Paul V, um, and it's on Zoom, not in this room. Okay, so everyone in this room, just please don't be in this room. <laughs> um, apparently, I'm going to have trouble showing both the um, to to both audiences the content. So I'm just going to change my display settings for a second. If you just Bear with me. It's uh, it's been over ten years since I've given a lecture at UQ, and things have changed. Da, 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 da. Okay. For me, I think it's simplest if we just have a single kind of window to the world. Um, I'll try and move this over so I can see it and 
So you can look a little. Okay. Um, my understanding is the audience on Zoom cannot see this annoying pop-up chat window here. And everyone else can. Okay. Okay. Can the people on Zoom confirm that they can see now some white text on my screen in a browser? Or not? Yes, thank you. Thank you, great. Let's move on. Too many technical issues. All right. Um, cool. So uh, so the, the kind of maths and concepts, the mathematical and modeling concepts that we're going to cover in Unit 6, um, we're, going, we're going to talk about pseudo-random numbers, okay? So how, how do you take a computer, a, you know, a CPU, which is fundamentally a deterministic machine, right? It's the most precise, um, well-tuned device, most complex device ever created by man, and it's completely deterministic. You give it some inputs, it could do, you know, 100 trillion different things and give you the same answer every time. Um, how do you use such a deterministic thing to make randomness, okay? Which is actually kind of a really interesting question. Um, and then if you, even if you could make some random bits on your CPU, how do you turn random bits into some arbitrary mathematical statistical distribution like a Gaussian or an exponential distribution or a binomial or Poisson distribution, okay? Um, so these two things we're gonna to cover today. Um, later on, we'll, we'll um, We'll, I'll give an overview of the um, how we're going to, you know, the, all the various different things you can do with randomness in Monte Carlo. Okay, so just a, a light overview um, of, of various different applications, and we'll move on to the actual discrete event simulator, and discrete event um, modeling, um, and I'll, I'll talk about how, how what it what it what it means to have an, a discrete event simulation engine. Okay. Uh, one of the, the core parts of this engine is going to be a heap data structure. So uh, just like it has been with Paul V, uh, we're going to use certain techniques to make sure that the simulations we do are fast. Okay. Um, as I was saying at the start, there's no point having a device that can do a trillion things a second and asking it to do something, you know, it, uh, with with the squared or the or cubed number of operations that it really requires, because that you know at that time scale you, you're really thinking you can only do one trillionth of what is potentially possible. For example, if your algorithm is n squared instead of n, for example. So it's very important um, to have to have an understanding of, of some data structures, and in this course we're we're, we're focusing a bit on the heap. Um, so. But aside from just the, the mathematical side of these things and the computer science side, um, we'll also have some more practical programming in Julia kind of learning. Okay, so we, we chose discrete event simulation over other forms of Monte Carlo, specifically because um, we, we have a, a little bit more interesting um, sort of programming, software engineering we can do about that. Okay, so with, with this topic, um, I think the, the, the actual goal of the simulation and, and the, the techniques used are kind of, they're simple enough to hold in your head um, that we can take it to the, really to the next level and build um, an actual engine, which doesn't just do one simulation, but an entire class of simulations, okay? So, um, so on the sort of programming side, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to actually program a heap data structure. Um, and we'll talk about some more concepts in Julia, like parametric types um, in more depth, how to structure a larger program using modules. Um, and you know, by the time we get to unit seven, we'll even be talking about packages and larger programs again. So we're working our way up to more practical, real world size pro computer programs. Um, and then we'll move on to, um, I, I will spend some time talking about how to, to benchmark you, you and optimize your code, okay? So even, even in this lecture, I will show you some tools at the REPL that can help you look inside your code. And as I go on, um, you know, there was a great question in the break about what profiling was, but I'll look at profiling. I'll, I'll show you how you can figure out where is you, your code spending the most time um, so that you can work on that one bit of the code and move on um, 
and make your code a lot faster. So what, what you often find in a computer program is 99% of the time of your program is spent on one place. And it doesn't matter how great or efficient, you know, the other 99% of the code is, you could, you could make all that other 99% twice as fast, it won't have any impact, right? It's usually there's one or two hotspots that you've got to work on um, to, to, make, to make things fast, okay? You know, and we'll talk about how to design types and things like that. So, and, and in terms of the actual um, discrete event simulations, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about a little bit about how to interpret the accuracy of these kind of Monte Carlo simulations and how to, how to go about or how to think about creating an engine for not, cal not just one simulation or to solve one problem, but to create a program you could give to other people that they could give configuration to and they could solve you know, any number of mathematical problems. Okay. Okay. Well, that's the overview. Um, do, do we have any, any questions? Would anyone like to say anything before I get into more of the mathematical content today? Okay. All right. So um, random number generators, as I mentioned, your, your computer is a, is, a, is a deterministic device by its nature. But there are, do exist something called a hardware random number generator. So for example, if you know much, if you've done a little bit of study in physics, you might know about thermodynamics. Um, you know, you might know that, you know, there's some fluctuations in the amount of heat and energy and things, some fluctuations in electric and magnetic fields and things just naturally at a given temperature. And you could basically essentially just measure that. So you could create something, a device in your computer, which is sort of sensitive to electrons moving left or electrons moving right. It's kind of random. Um, uh, and it would, it would kind of measure, measure, measure that. Um, it would depend on the environment somehow. Um, but for all intents and purposes, that would, would give you some random signal, okay? Might be biased to more zero bits than one bits or something. And there are techniques for solving that um, to essentially compress the, the, the randomness. Um, but yeah, the, you can buy off the shelf random hardware random number generators. Um, there's, in your CPU, there are some, they're a lot slower than the rest of the operations in your CPU. Um, but they're useful for cryptography because very every now and again, when you're on the internet or something, your computer will create an actual true random number to help um, create an encrypted connection to some other computer. Um, you can buy, as a, as a quantum physicist, I find this one fascinating. You can buy a device where you press a button and it will give you a random number using uh, quantum mechanics. So if you know a little bit of quantum mechanics, you can, you know, you can, things can be in a state of being, you know, in state A or state B, the cat can be alive or dead, and you can perform a measurement of the superposition and get it one way or the other. Um, like I was saying earlier, like the thermal fluctuations in that, it, it's interesting. If you had a sophisticated eavesdropper, they could simulate, they could actually get a signal on that and, and figure out um, or create some signal that's correlated to your random signal. So that it might appear random, but actually, you know, the other side knows exactly what your signal is. But with these quantum um, random number generators, you kind of, proving that, that that scenario is impossible using the power of physics, which, is, which I think is really fascinating. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, okay, but a pseudo random number generator, it's, not, it's a, num a number generator that's not random, it's actually deterministic, but the numbers come out all jumbled and you just, you don't know that it's, it's for all intents and purposes, it's random. For, for all you know, it's hard to sort of reverse engineer what it was um, to understand how it was made, it just seems like random gibberish, random bits, random numbers. Okay. Um, so in 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 Julia, there's this function called rand. So if I bring up this window and I go to that window and I type rand, it will give me a random floating point number. If I run it again, it'll give me a different one. And in this case, the number's always between zero and half. No, zero and one. It's just that I'm unlucky. If I go long enough, we'll get, we'll get a large one. I just know it. 
Ah, oh, we win. Okay. Um, you can, this function is a generic function in Julia. It can actually produce random other things. So I could create um, random bits, let's say. Um, so I can create a random eight bits. So I could create 64 random bits. Um, I could create a random number between one and 10. So there's various different things you can do with this function. It's, it's really cool, it's really useful. And there's a series of other functions um, for doing statistical distributions. There's functions like randn, n here is for normal, so the normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. Um, and it, it just draws, draws numbers from a Gaussian distribution of standard deviation one. Um, there's randexp for an exponential distribution. And there's a package called distributions.jl, which we'll look at, which um, defines a whole bunch of mathematical distributions, so all, the, all the ones that you'd be familiar with from your study, a whole bunch more that you're not familiar with yet. Um, all right. So how does the rand function really work? Okay, so as I say, it produces a random number in the interval between zero and one. Normally this is defined such that it's inclusive of zero and exclusive of one. Okay, it's just part of the definition. You can rely on that in your code if it's important for some reason. Um, the, um, the way a, 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 a pseudo random number generator works is it, it, it keeps a history or, or some state in the background about what was produced last time or the time before even and using and the the next random number is really a deterministic function of all that history and hidden state okay so you can start with some seed which we're going to call x0 x0 okay and that can be specified like you, you can you can choose that the number could be one the number could be 42 the number could be whatever number you you want it to be um and then x1 is some function of the seed and from that you, you sort of in a sense you once x1 once you've once you've calculated x1 in the background it's sort of modified that seed to be some other number right essentially and then you do another step and you get x2 based on that new C, new hidden state, um, and then X3 and X4 and so on. So let's say you start your simulation with a seed of zero, you, you would always get the same series of numbers every single time, okay? So uh, like I was saying with the hardware random number generator in your CPU, what you'd often need to do is you just, at the start of the program, if you really want a true randomness, you could just ask it, to do that once to get to set that seed to be random and then the rest of the numbers you can use the fast pseudo number random generator afterwards okay so there are some properties you want you can't just use any function i could have the function f of x equals x plus one okay let's so i'm trying to make random bits or something but that wouldn't really satisfy our definition of what a random number generator should do that, that's not a very random sequence of numbers um so you'd expect the elements xi and xj um, should appear to be pretty much independent of each other, right? Like they can't just be like xi is, is you know, xj plus one or something, you know. Um, so, so basically, you sh given that you know xi, you shouldn't really be able to predict xj, essentially, in an in information theoretical sense. Um, the distribution of all the different x's, they should pretty much, you know, we're, we're trying to find this uniform random number generated between zero and one. You know, there shouldn't be like more small numbers than big numbers, although I'm a bit suspicious after my earlier experiment. Um, the range, yes, the range covered by XN, you know, it needs to be defined. It's a part of the, the, the random number generator. And, and the sequence should repeat itself as rarely as possible. So if we have a certain number of bits of hidden state and, and number of bits making up X, you know, if I had two to 64 bits, say, of, of, of seed state, hidden state, it's sort of impossible, you know, at, at the very least, the, the cycle of random numbers has to repeat itself 
after two to the 64 times because you, eventually you're going to collide with one of your previous two to the 64 possibilities that you're seeing and you and from then it's deterministic so it's going to follow the same cycle so these, these pseudo random number generators they're always cyclic they always follow some cycle and you want this cycle to be very large so generally speaking i would think if it's you know if there's if we're talking about 64 bit numbers um or whatever it, the, the cycles are usually of size square root of that two to the 64 or larger if preferably okay um yeah so okay um generally computer works in bits so we, we generally try and create a, you know a bunch of random bits 16 32 64 128 random bits based on previous seed state and then turn those bits into a floating point number. So one way of doing that is you could just divide it by two to the power of L if you have L bits. Um, unfortunately, dividing two integers to get a floating point number also isn't very fast. Uh, so it's actually much better to do a little trick. Um, you, you, Paul Bellet showed you how a floating point number was constructed on a computer with an antistor and an exponent. Um, so if you're looking at a number between zero and one with a uniform distribution, what you can do is you can just set the exponent to zero and fill in the mantissa with random bits. So for a float 64, there's 52 bits of mantissa. Um, in the floating point standard, the, the, there's, a implicitly, there's an implicit rule that the, the highest order bit is set to one. So it's not represented in the, in the thing explicitly. Um, so, so you set the exponent to zero, the high order bit is one. So the number is one plus some fraction. Um, so you, and that fraction is some random thing depending on the mantissa. So you get, you get a number between the range between one and two, okay? It's always less than two, but it could possibly be equal to one if all the mantissa bits are zero. Um, and then what we do is we subtract 1.0 from that to get a number between zero and one, okay? So, this is not really fitting on the screen so great, but I've just sort of got some, um, I actually looked at how Julia does random numbers. It literally follows this, this algorithm. Um, I've sort of shortened the code to fit on the screen. Um, but yeah, it's basically, th this, this represents the exponent of zero. Um, if you remember the exponent has an interesting encoding, so it's not zero, but um, yeah, so that, that's basically how you create a random continuous number on a computer. Um, yeah, I don't know if it, the reinterpret function just takes the bits from, you know, one type and pretends it's some other type. Okay. Are there any, are there any questions? Hang on. Let's see. We see the browser on about half the screen. Oh my God, my bath, wow. Let me check if I've got my charger. I'm gonna be in trouble here. I didn't expect the, the, the uh, streaming must chew the battery. Sorry about that. Good. Okay, so so some oh, Yoni is saying we see the browser on about half the screen. Are the people at home having troubles viewing the, the text I have um, here on the on the monitor? Okay, that's fine. All right, cool. Um, so yeah. So if we look at a, a, a simple pseudo random number generator, one of the, um, 
Oh yeah, right. One one way of 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 trying to just create some randomness is just to create some um, some kind of random. Uh, some random bits on the computer is just just to do something like this. So here I'm just going to create some memory in a vector of integers, um, and let's say I take 10, 10 of them or something, and it's just it hasn't zeroed out all the bits. It's just taken whatever was at RAM beforehand. So okay. So so what I do here it's not deterministic. Um, there's some actually interesting patterns here emerging, um, but if, you know if you run at different times you get different bits sometimes it reallocates over itself um so this is just stuff that's in ram it's not very random it's either zero or close to this number um but it's not really deterministic either but that's not very interesting for our purposes um you know we really want to guarantee it comes from a certain distribution uh one way of um creating one really simple way of creating random numbers called a um, linear congruent uh, congruential generator um, or LCG. So LCGs are basically the probably the systems that were probably still in vogue when I when I started my research um, some years ago. So they, they would have dominated for like 20 or 30 years um, in in the late 1900s, early 2000s. Um, so the way you do that is is you have the previous X xn here okay and you just want to multiply it by a number add another number and take a modulus okay now this doesn't seem very obvious at first why this would be useful or interesting uh for for certain combinations of numbers it's not you know a could be one you know, c could be one m could be two to the 64 and it would just be you know incrementing numbers or if all the numbers are even you can never get an odd number okay for this to work, it only works for very certain specific combinations of A, C, and M. But with very specific combinations of A, C, and M, it just appears that the numbers jump around really, really well. The cycle time is very big. You know? um, it's hard to predict one number from the previous. Um, so for M equals 32, which is fine, if you're trying to create like a 32-bit integer or a 32-bit floating point number, you can set A to... Um, Oh, that's a bit, a bit hidden here. Six nine zero oh, six nine and c to one, and that actually produces a random number generator, which is reasonably decent. Okay, it's not brilliant. Like you could see patterns in the data if you go looking for it, but you know, trust me, all the computer games you would have grown, grow, played growing up when you were little would use something like this to generate the randomness where the monsters appear and explosions happen and whatever else happened. In your computer game, Solitaire, Minesweeper, these sort of games. Um, so here we've got some code. Uh, we're using plots. I believe you would have seen plots, um, latex strings, and measures. Um, so we're defining ACMM as this special combination of things. If you're interested in what combinations work, you can find them on Wikipedia or whatever these days. Uh, it used to be a bit of a dark art trying to figure out what numbers were were good. You'd have to look up a three-volume book by Nuth or something to, to get to get the right numbers. Um, here we're going to we've got this next function, which which basically, given the previous z, it'll give you the new one, um, and uh, we're going to populate one million things in an array. Okay, so we start with the seed of eight hundred eight, um, and we're going to um every time update the seed with the next seed and we're just dividing here uh so remember this was a modulus the mo um so if we divide then we get um between zero and one or zero and just below one okay so this is a if we if we make a scatter plot here in p1 on the on the x-axis here is the trial we didn't um well, we did a million trials, but we're only plotting a thousand of them. So here's the first thousand samples. And on the y-axis is the value of the sample. And you can see they're jumping all over the place. There's some down the bottom, there's some up the top. They don't seem to be, you know, trials that are next to each other. They don't seem to be close to each other. You know, there's no 
obvious zigzags or patterns or, or, or you know, lines or anything appearing in, in this pattern. It's, it's a reasonable random number generator. You do see voids and clusters and things, but that's actually representative of the true statistics you expect. Okay, so randomness isn't sort of uniform. It look, it's meant to look clumpy and voidy and, and things. So that's that's good. Um, the second plot is a histogram of what this number is over all, all a million samples um, into bins of size something, I don't know, 0.05 or something. Um, and you can see here, basically, they all have a similar density, okay? So between, it's, it, these numbers are pretty uniform over the range zero to one, okay? And the period of this random number generator um, is, is quite large. I, I didn't calculate it, sorry, but maybe, maybe that would have been an interesting one, um, thing to have. But yeah, it's, it's you know, not a small number. It, it, it takes a long time for it to repeat itself. Uh, okay. So in Julia, there's this rand function. Um, how many minutes have we got? Yeah, cool. Uh, so in the background, the rand function keeps a, a random number generator in, in its memory. So I'm going to show you something. I'm going to go at edit. Who's seen a macro? Did you guys cover macros yet? Yeah, okay. So if we go at edit rand, it will actually take me to the code in the in the standard library and, and show you what's happening. Um, da, 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 it's a bit hard to see on the screen. I apologize because they've made it a single line function. But basically, um, it fills in uh, um, a, a random number generator for you called the default one. Okay. And by default, it goes to float 64. So I can go rand um, and then um, using random, uh, we can see that there is this default random number generator. Was that a function? Yeah. So this is the one that exists in the background. Um, it's called a mersenne twister. So it's not a linear congruent generator. It's a mersenne twister random number generator. I'm not going to tell you the algorithm, but what you can see these numbers here are at state. So um, I mentioned hidden state earlier. It's not always just the previous number. It could have more bits of hidden state. So you might be generating 64-bit numbers, but you might have 256 bits of hidden state or something like that. Okay. Uh, and we can really see everything that's in that with dump. Um, so you can kind of see, wow, it's got, it's got a lot more state than I thought it did. <laughs> Anyway, it, it's not, not simple enough that I want to go through this in the next 10 minutes to explain how it works. But it produces nice uniform distributions. Um, it's relatively fast. Uh, it was considered state of the art, um, certainly 10, 15 years ago. Um, yeah. So uh, what we can do is instead of using this hidden random number generator that's in the background, we can create our own random number generators. Um, so this RNG thing, and we can use it ourselves. Okay, so if we if we um, create one with a seed of twenty seven, uh, you, you know we can create a couple random numbers, an integer, a couple floating point numbers. If we create another one with exactly the same seed, we get exactly the same random number generated random numbers back. Now, normally you would think, no, I want more randomness. Why would I want to undo the randomness? But there's really great power in, in in, um, in being able to repeat your experiments. So, so if, if you're doing something on the computer and you're debugging your code and it changes every time, it's really hard to tell what's going on. So it's really powerful um, to be able to know that everything's going to be the same um, when you rerun the code, okay? So that's great for debugging. It's also really interesting from a mathematical point of view. Um, Yoni has created a really nice example. Uh, we've got this random walk here. So we've got this path function. It will create a path of a, a little point that starts at the origin and it moves left, right, up, or down. So we're doing this, this flip, okay? This flip, it's um, picking a number between one and four, which basically means north, south, east, west, okay? So if, if, you, go, you, um, if you get one or two, you're gonna go up or to the right. If you get three, you might move left. 
Um, and if you're going four, you might move down. Okay, so it's sort of a, an asymmetric random walk. Um, and what we've got here is this, uh, the, the plots of, of, of our experiments where we've started with um, what we're doing here. Sorry, I should, I should explain this. There's this free parameter alpha. So alpha says, how far are you moving to the left or down? So if alpha is zero, in this case, you're not biased. If you flip, if you flip one, you're gonna go up one. And if you flip three, you're gonna go down between minus two and zero randomly. Okay, so on average you stay in the middle, but it's just it's a random stochastic walk. Okay, so if alpha's um, a big number, you're gonna move a positive number. You're gonna move down and to the left in the simulation. If it's a negative number, you're gonna move up and to the right in the simulation. Okay. Now, if we wanted to look at these three different alphas, 0 0.2, 0 0.21, and 0.22, to see the effect of alpha. Um, we could do that and, and create a plot. But what we're going to do is we're going to do this um, three different colors with the same seed and the same one here. Um, so recreating the seed be before each experiment with the same seed. And here we're just continuing on with the random number generator and the, the different random numbers are going to come out in these experiments. So what we see on the left is we have this random walk where we started at zero, zero. We wandered around. Alpha is a positive number, so we're moving down into the left. And you can see in the blue experiment, we've moved down into here. In the red experiment, we've moved a bit further. In the green experiment, we move further again. Okay, so this is 0 0.2, 0 0.21, and 0 0.22. If we use different seeds, we actually get three completely different random walks. You know, the green one ended here, the red one ended there, the blue one ended there. It's hard to tell what the pattern is. What, what is the trend as we change alpha? We'd have to actually do many, many, many more experiments to be able to measure and plot the trend of where things are moving with respect to alpha, what's the sensitivity of the experiment with respect to alpha, okay? So um, when, so, it's, so not only is it useful for debugging purposes, but it's also very useful for reducing statistical variances in differences, okay? So when you wanna look at derivatives or differences or changes with respect to some input parameter, it can be really, really, really good if the random numbers are being drawn the same way. Okay. That's cool. What time have we got? So my understanding is in a few minutes, we're going to have to um, wrap up for the day. You normally finish at 50 past, or do you go a bit further? Someone's going to have to speak up. I don't know. I'll go to seven typically. Thanks, Shani. All right. So we've got 10 minutes. So... Um, We've sort of spoken about how to generate random bits using something like a congruent generator or a Mersenne twister. Uh, we've spoken about how to get a uniform distribution, but I didn't, I didn't show you how you're going to get to other kinds of distributions, like binomial, exponential, Gaussian distributions. So sometimes it's not particularly difficult. This is one you'll see in code. If, you, if you're doing mathematical modeling, uh, you're going to see this kind of thing in code a lot. Okay, so you draw a random number between zero and one. If the number's less than half, we call it heads. If it's more than half, we call it tails. Okay, that's a coin toss. It, it, it gives a 50-50% probability. If you want it to be 30% probability, you just check if the random number's less than 0.3. Okay, so you can see this function has this P, the probability of um, the answer being one. So if, if P was 0.3, 70% um, of the time, the random number would be greater than P and 30% of the time would be less than P. Um, and so 30% of the time you end up with one. Okay. Um, if you want to generate a random number over some other range, not from zero to one, you can just add and scale. So you just multiply by the length of the range, B minus A, and you add A. Um, so some, sometimes it's really easy to come up with an analytical solution of how to transform a uniform distribution into some other distribution. And like the first one's an example where it's, it's not even a continuous distribution anymore. We made it into a discrete, discrete distribution. Okay. Sometimes, um, uh, this is an interesting one. 
So if you want to, if you care about speed, to do a binomial distribution, you might actually take advantage of the fact that you're generating more than one bit of randomness per um, per sample. Okay. So if you want a binomial distribution um, with with uh, Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm going off on a tangent. Here, here, here. We're just using a binomial distribution, which which draws from this one. So it uses this. It does it many, many times to make a binomial. A binomial is just when you when you're doing more than one twin cost, two, three, four, five twin costs. Um, but there's only two states, zero, uh, um, zero, one heads or tails. Um, so, you, you know, we analytically know the standard deviation of the mean. Um, and we can, for example, do some sampling here um, where, we, where, we, where we, we find the mean and standard deviation of, um, of some, something. Uh, there's this package called distributions.jl. Uh, it's worth looking at if, you, if you've got any time. Um, it can create distributions for you, it has, has, has many, many different distributions and it knows things about them. It can find the mean of the distribution without sampling. It knows like the mean of the Gaussian, um, standard deviation of Gaussian, that, that kind of thing. It can tell you straight analytically what the answer is. Okay, so but this statistical sampling that we're doing, we did a million samples and found the mean and standard deviation here. Um, and here, we get the exact answers and you can see that they're very close. So we did a million samples. They're going to be close to around a factor of a thousand, you know, the square root of me, generally speaking. Um, and you can sort of see that they start to differ at the third decimal place. So um, that, that's roughly what we expect. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a, I got a bit lost. So this, this, sorry, that's what this was down here. This is the exact answer. Here we've done some sampling. This is again a sample, random sampling from distributions. So distributions also lets you use rand on a distribution. So instead of taking the random floating 64-bit number or something like that, you can take rand of a distribution. It'll give you a distribution. This final number is the number of samples to take. Um, all right, but the bit I really want to get to in the last five minutes here is, is how to do something a bit more non-trivial, okay? So uh, one, one thing which might seem a bit magical for now, but it isn't too magical, is this formula here. So what we want to do is we want to take a uniform distribution and, and, and create a Gaussian distribution. And I'll just show you the results here at the bottom. Um, this is a histogram of the results with, I believe, a million samples. Uh, the red line is the actual um, PDF for the Gaussian. Um, and if we follow this formula, we get something really interesting. Um, so the way I think about this, if you remember your calculus, first year calculus, uh, if you wanted to find the integral of a Gaussian, it's actually really hard to do that in 1D. The trick is to do it in two dimensions. You time, you know, um, a Gaussian of X and a Gaussian of Y, you multiply them. And it's sort of this spheric, uh, circularly symmetric um, distribution, okay? And then you, you look at it in terms of radial and polar coordinates, and it's uniform over the polar coordinate. So there's something here about cos of 2 pi times rand, right? So this is a hint. Um, so we're looking at uh, something uniform in the angle and has uh, a, a distribution of r times an exponential of r in um in the distance okay and that is something you can solve with a, with uh integration by parts and do it analytically and you end up with you know that's how you get the square root of two pi term out of um the integral of a gaussian and this is a, doing pretty much exactly the same trick um it's it's very hard to think of how to transform a uniform distribution into a Gaussian one, but it's actually, if you take two random numbers in a uniform distribution, you can actually transform them reasonably easily into um, a 2D point in a 2D Gaussian. 
Okay, so from these two random uniform numbers, you can actually create two random Gaussian numbers. The difference is the other pair would actually use the sign. So you, you'd, you'd, you'd record what those two random numbers were in, in a real algorithm and um, use them twice. So that because the random function is relatively expensive. Um, you'd also do other tricks in real life to get rid of the signs and the causes and stuff to make it faster again um, with rejection sampling, but we won't talk about that. So the idea is um, there's this log here. So this gives you a bit of a hint what's going on. If I take the log of a random number, that distribution is actually sort of exponential. Um, so, so there's a general solution for that reason for that. I don't believe we're going to have, we've only got three minutes. Yeah. So there's this general thing is that if you have uh, um, the, the CDF, so not the PDF, the, um, the, the integral of the probability distribution, which is, it starts at zero on the far left and goes to one on the far right. Um, and it's a monotonic function. If you sort of invert that function, um, you, and sample that with a random number between zero and one, you, you always get the distribution you're interested in, okay? So if I had, unfortunately we don't do like whiteboards and blackboards anymore, but basically if you, if you kind of come across at the level you want or the probability you want, you, you, you pick a sample. Um, yeah, I really wish I'd put a picture in here, so I apologize for that. Um, so, and it turns out if you, if you try and do that with this two-dimensional Gaussian thing, you can reasonably easily come up with this formula. Okay, I won't get into it, but what we do have here is um, the same thing, but not for Gaussian distribution, but this triangular distribution, um, where, we, where we know that the, the, uh, the shape of the C CDF is like a couple of um, pollen, um, matching, joining um, quadratic functions. So it's piecewise quadratic. Um, is that right? Or have I got that wrong? Was it piecewise linear? I'm probably making this up as I go too much. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is using distributions to do it for you. But basically, yeah, you know, you can always create uh, a sample from any distribution you want if you can calculate the CDF and invert it. Sort of an interesting trick. Um, that's all we're gonna talk about today. Uh, thanks everyone here for being here. I'm actually joining you again in a couple of weeks. Um, you get some time with Paul V tomorrow to consult on your project, project one. Um, so Sorry? Remote only. remote only, yes. If you're in this room today, don't be here tomorrow. Um, remote only. Uh, and so good luck with that. Um, and you'll hear from me after the, the semester, mid-semester break. And we'll go on and we'll, we'll get into this event simulation. We'll create this event simulation engine. And then we'll move on to Unit 7. Thank you, everyone. Right. You tell me. No, I don't know. Well, I was out for No, I know. I'm, jo I'm joking with you. I'm joking with you. Uh, yeah, I uh, think we erred. Me and Yanni, we needed to make our generic polynomials use big ints. I think we implemented polynomial arithmetic mod 2 to the power of 63, technically speaking, because we use like int. And not uh, was that with like the big int, int. Yeah. Well, no, that student actually did manage. I'm still to, on microphone. To help. Yeah. Let me stop sharing. And I'm going to stop recording. Cancel the spotlight video. No, stop. Stop recording.